Oregon. And um, this was one of those talks that starts out with something like, I went to a cooker lit workshop and it changed my life. So in this case, a workshop was from cooker lit this year and was presented by folks from Stanford and DPLA on Apache Spark. Spark is a great tool for handling massive data sets, but it's also turned out to be pretty handy for small projects too. I wouldn't say that I've become a power user of Spark in the last few months, but um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start out by showing you uh, maybe an example or something that I just did a few days ago. Um, see, so in this case, um, our metadata team wanted to know how much uh, each predicate in Oregon Digital was being used. So I started out um, to create my data set. I started out with a solar query to grab all of the assets. And then, uh, what did I do? I, I ran them through uh, rep to find the predicate, and then uh, I captured the, the collection uh, by uh, set. So now I have this data set that's just a list of all of the collections each time it shows up for a given predicate. And then, of course, I wanted to get a total from that. So, uh, I, I loaded in my, my text file. So in this case, the, the field that I'm looking for is coverage, or the predicate I'm looking for is the coverage. And then I throw three function, built-in functions on it, and boom, I have my result. <coughs> so that was just like really like minutes to you know to get to get this uh, get these numbers. And then you know I wrote the whole thing in a script so I could just run everything, you know, uh, just launch everything. So basically, because the data set is so simple. Spark will just automatically create a schema for you, so you don't have to do that either. Um, another way to do this, um, the same simple example, um, you can, uh, let's see, that first line, I'm now taking the, my thing, and I'm creating um, a view of it, and now I can run Sparkle, uh, uh, SQL, sorry, SQL queries on it. So now I've just redone the same thing. <coughs> But, uh, and again, you know, like that, that took like a minute to do. So another example that I did earlier in the summer, uh, the folks on our systems department were trying to figure out how much bandwidth is being used for uh, DSpace downloads, sort of plan for uh, future capacity. So I started out with my data set. I did a Postgres query in, in DSpace to get all the bitstream IDs and their files I would uh, I looped through this list um, doing uh, solar statistics queries to get the number of downloads for each for each stream. And then I combined those into my data file and stuck that into Spark. Um, Spark. And then again, ran a query, and then uh, uh, let's see, so I multiplied the, um, I created a new column in Spark, uh, multiplying the, the two numbers, the, the number of the, the, uh, the stream size and the number of downloads, and then I have a third column, and then I just told Spark to add the third column, and then I have my, my number. Um, so that, again, that was, that, was, that was pretty quick, and then I think systems also have their own method for generating that data, so they use, they compare the two numbers, and I don't know what conclusion it came to, but, but that was fun. So in both of these examples, the, the data sets, you know, like I created them, or, um, and they were pretty simple, so um, again, Spark was able to just uh, create the schema uh, right then and there. But not all data sets are, are like that. And so I had another project this summer where um, I had this, uh, this dump that I took from our, our CVM, our OPEC namespace. And uh, the, the data is, is pre the, the meta, metadata for those, uh, those terms, uh, they're kind of like nested. So like, for instance, a value might be an array. And, um, so I tried running a schema for that one, and um, it was hard. And then when I tried to run it, I, uh, when I tried to load everything in Spark, um, it turns out that the, the data structure um, changes over time, and so that that didn't work out. That didn't work out so well. So Spark doesn't work for everything, you know, like boom. I mean, sometimes uh, you have to kind of like question whether or not it's worth the effort to to get the data into to the place, the data in your schema to the place where you can actually use things. So my uh, final example, um, yeah, so uh, the, the goal was uh, we, when we migrated one of our collections in Oregon Digital from Contentium, we changed from strings to URIs, and unfortunately some of those URIs were corrupt, 
And so when we, uh, so the, the labels never got fetched. That's how we knew there was something wrong. And so when you go into the uh, metadata on uh, uh, from Fedora now, you know there, there's there's no indication of what that original value was supposed to be. So I had to go back to the content DM export. So I discovered. Uh, to my delight, that it wasn't that actually that hard to load the content DM export into Spark. I mean, just like uh, the the export is sort of quasi XML, so I just had to like kind of tweak it a little bit to make it to make it read in. Um, I, I did have to generate a, a schema, but then um, then the whole thing uh, just worked like a dream. And then I wrote, I wrote this you know little uh, Python script. So so here's my query, sort of so that I could just sort of rapidly shoot through um, all of the all of the all of the assets. So let's see. So the lines are the assets, and then um, let's see. I think the uh, the array is uh, no fields. Uh, fields are the predicates I'm looking for, and then the array is uh, the um, <coughs> the uh, the asset. So that's the asset identifier. And then, I, and then I print out whatever, whatever was stashed in that field. So now I've, I've, I've actually got a list of the original strings again, uh, along with uh, the asset identifier. And then we were able to take that information and then repopulate those, those assets. So, um, so yeah, so after I, I did this, I had this moment where like, I wish I could go back in time and hand my, my past self spark so that I could have used it when we were actually migrating or getting digital, it would have been so useful to have this. I wrote a lot of really bad, <coughs> janky PHP scripts to, to, to work on the, on the content GM files. So, um, so anyway, so that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it here, just to like, you know, share the love and spread the good news. Um, my last slide. So okay, um, I, I managed to track down Christina Harlow, who was one of the presenters of the Cochlear workshop that I took. And she gave her blessing for me to, to put, put this, uh, this is the GitHub uh, repo that has all, like, all of the stuff that we use, tutorials and um, Docker images. So uh, that's how I've, been, I've actually been running this, is I just pulled down the Docker image and I'm running it through a container. It works great. Um, of course, the first one is the, the Spark uh, homepage. This last one, I threw up some of the, the code that I used for the content DM uh, work that I just did uh, this summer. Again, I'm from the University of Oregon, and thank you. Good luck with that, because now we're migrating to Oregon to show again. But our metadata is flawless now, oh, right? Yeah.